So thank you to all, and thanks again for the opportunity to talk and to sure share some stories and you know I'll talk about a little bit about our journey through the National Park Service and thinking about things. I'll, I will apologize in advance for the usual the Zoom world. You might hear a lot of dogs in the background at some point or the other. But I think it's important since we are talking about diversity and inclusion that we start with acknowledging the land that Colorado State University sits upon. So I'd like to read our land acknowledgement statement. So Colorado State University acknowledges with respect that the land we are on today is the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, the Cheyenne and the Ute nations and people. It's, this was also a site of trade, gathering and healing for numerous other native tribes. We recognize the indigenous peoples as original stewards of this land and all the relatives within it. And as these words of acknowledgement are spoken and heard, the ties the nations have to their traditional homelands are renewed and reaffirmed. Colorado State University is founded as a land grant institution, and we accept that our mission must encompass access to education and inclusion. And significantly, that our founding came at dire cost to native nations and people whose land this university was built upon. This acknowledgement is the ed education inclusion we must practice in recognizing our institutional history, responsibility, and commitment. And I'd like to pause just for a second here, again, as we're talking about the diversity and inclusion, and point out that this statement was actually written by the three tribes. The first part of the statement was written by the Arapaho, the Cheyenne, and the Ute nations. And the second part was written by Colorado State University. And such collaboration is so important as we acknowledge our culture and our landscapes, and as we talk about things like identity and sense of place. So I want to take a second to acknowledge my own heritage, so to speak, um, in thanking the National Park Service leadership. I was really fortunate to have an amazing group of of sponsors and people who sort of keep out of you and as you graduate students, et cetera, sometimes these um, advisors, but Dr. Betty Lizell was my advisor and we're still wonderful friends to this day and keep in touch and make sure we're all moving on our own paths in life. But I want to start at the beginning. <clears throat> and part of the idea of starting about the beginning when we think about ecology and diversity and inclusion in these natural spaces, it's, it's to understand where people are from. And where they get on their own journey is so important as to how we succeed in engaging them in science. So I have this rather expired Ranger Rick card that one of my aunts found and sent to me. Um, it's been expired for a couple of decades, so at least. Um, but it's important to think about this start because when you look at identity as someone from Brooklyn, New York, um, who goes into wildlife ecology, that you know, we have all sorts of assumptions that come into what that person is. Um, and so it's important to start that Ranger Rick was an important part of my life early on. I like to say one of my best publications, I actually got published in Ranger Rick and I, they don't count the citation factor, but that's my, that's my top publication so far is <laughs> being cited in Ranger Rick and trying to get students excited. So what I wanna talk about is why um, identity matters and why identity matters when we look at diversity, equity, and inclusion, and why those three things are not the same, and why perhaps we should not put those three things together as if it's one complex thing that um, has a, a common goal. And for African-American female in ecology, I would like to highlight that my identity is not my pronouns, because my identity is not additive. So I cannot separate being a woman of color from being a woman or vice versa. And those two don't add up, they intersect. So I hope we want to highlight a little bit of that as we go through. <clears throat> so being black in ecology is part of this issue of blindness and understanding, is it nature that black people don't like? Or is it something more complicated in terms of how people identify with being in nature and what that actually means? Whoops, sorry about that. So I wanna cover a couple of things today and think about ecological blind spots, as most of you are in the environmental field. And then what is the connection with that, with the Me Too movement and Black Lives Matters? And just sort of pause and think about that for a second is how do those things actually go together? And there is a common theme, so I'll talk about the end, 
that I firmly believe does not get discussed enough is when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I think our core questions are, why is the environmental science enterprise so underdiverse? Is it a student problem? Is it a, a discipline problem? They didn't get enough science in high school? Or is it a systematic bondage to both? And does this focus on JEDI or DEI actually address any of that? And if so, where does sustainability and equity fit in? So I want to start with looking at blind spots. What does a lack of diversity in ecological scientific enterprise potentially mean? And I will say these are actually all of my students. Um, and I'm really got an amazing group of students that have gone through Yellowstone. This is my sort of home park, and I take students there every year. So I think we need to start and think about the numbers. And everybody's probably heard these numbers, but I think what's happened is the change in these numbers is important to pay attention to. Oops, sorry. So if you look at 2013, white men were 50% of our workforce and white women were 20. And women of color were five. And that's all women of color, Asian, black, Hispanic, et cetera, mixed race. Look what's happening now. We're at 2020. White women now in our department and in most environmental fields are overrepresented. The average around 62% in most fields at the undergraduate and moving into the graduate and even in the faculty level. Our faculty is 62%, 62% white female. I'm the only black minority female faculty in the college. We know we have one other Hispanic woman now. So the, the numbers are dramatically different. So you think about that number more than doubled in less than 10 years, from 2013 to, 2000 to, to, to 2021. Number of women of color, it's still 5%. It hasn't managed to break 5%. And it's important to think about that trajectory when we try and discuss diversity inclusion as to what does that mean and how do we address it? So if you get this down to the numbers, it's not just that it's less than 5%, but in some fields, the numbers are overrepresented. So women, for the first time in science history, are the majority in most of the earth sciences. Now, geosciences and atmospheric sciences are a little bit further behind. Ecology, wildlife biology, et cetera. If you look around, and you probably can look in your own graduate body, you'll find that you're probably at close to parity or exceed parity in terms of the number of women. So but what does that mean when you think about that? in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, is that throughout that time, and this is looking at the graduate degrees, out of 760 graduate degrees, we only have 45 that were black, and that's across all the sciences. And if you look at Colorado State, we've graduated 600 undergraduate students in the last five years, of which a total of six were black. So we barely made 1%. And Hispanics actually managed to break double digits and they made it to 10, no, total of 10 individuals graduating. So the numbers are really bad. And the numbers have not changed from the diversity perspective, but they have changed from the gender perspective. So why I like to highlight this when we start talking about diversity is that the experience for women of color is really bad at the moment. It has not changed. So when we talk about, well, we're going to put a pronoun down on your professional signature line. Right now, that pronoun, if you put down female, means white female, because 65% will be white female, and very few will be women of color, and that's not my identity. So it's this interesting piece of understanding where our identity comes and how we are represented in the field and what does that mean. So I'd like us to think, and I'll repeat this graphic, of diversity, equity, inclusion as three different forces that actually move in different directions. And if we stop and think about those three things, it makes sense that they're not all going the same way. So diversity is moving one way, but the inclusion of gender is moving a different, different way. And understanding those dynamics, that tension within, is a really important thing. You're just sort of thinking through, what's our strategy to deal with it? Do we just go out and recruit a student and you know, dump them in the middle of a field somewhere or dump them in a biology department and hope they survive? Or think about what are the different elements that move? So I want you to think a little bit about that diversity is really that external piece, where equity may be that sort of equal piece, equal importance, and inclusion tends to be more internal. 
And those things are moving at different forces. And as we look in the environmental field, they come into collision when we look at the field environment and how we take students out into the field and in different places. But if you ask the question, what impacts ecologists of color in the field, you'll notice that not, none of the four things is science or has anything to do with science and also do with social. So I want to spend the last remainder of my talk talking about the impacts of other things that, that create a lack of diversity within our field that have nothing to do with the science itself. So the old adage when I first started with the National Park Service is like, well, if you just got more black people outside, you'd get more black people in the field. Or if you just get more Hispanics to go and picnic in the parks, we'll get more Hispanic visitors. But if you look at that visitor's perspective, everything can come back as social. It is not the, the connection to nature. It's not the understanding of nature. It's not your first time in nature. It's a lot about, do I feel safe? Do I feel like I belong? Do I feel like I need to be here? So what are these intersections? And what I spend some time on looking at is three main intersections. How do you identify? Do you think you belong? And how do you connect to that place? And I'd like to argue that all of those connect back to this issue of security that I want to spend some time with at the end. So an identity is like a stock in the beginning can be how you identify as a scientist. And in this case, the scientist is on the left, not on the right. And what does a scientist look like? And what does that intersection mean? To think that I am a scientist and I feel like I'm a scientist, you know, that's that internal, uh, how I've designed myself as a scientist. We can also look at belonging, which is really important, which is so much what your graduate student group is actually doing, you know, creating this idea of a cohort. I belong to a team. I belong here. And you look at this group, more of my students, um, you don't know who's this is their first time in the National Park. You don't know who this is in Rocky Mountain National Park. You don't know who is this their first time camping because they all belong to this group. They all identify as this group. And that's an important part of how we persist as a scientist in the field and how we stay in the field as scientists. And that sense of belonging as a team becomes even more important when you might be other otherwise. So for a black woman of color, if I feel like I belong in a team, am I more likely to persist in an environment where I may not feel welcome otherwise? So being able to have that team support, is that camaraderie, the peer support, just like you guys are doing in graduate school, is often overlooked as a core competency for us to becoming a scientist. Just having that sense that I'm part of this team and I can be part of what I want to do here. And when you put the whole mess out in the field, and this is Grand Teton National Park, this issue of identity, this issue of belonging and feeling like you're okay in this place is so important for how we get students to persist in the outside and persist in their field. And the last piece, which is really complicated, is this, what we call the sense of place. And why it's more complicated is because I think we often think about, okay, we're gonna go out and re recruit all these students to diversify our numbers. And we're gonna recruit, let's go get, we need some Native American students and we need some African American students, we need some Hispanic students. But what's that sense of place? If your land, if your university, like my university, sits on land that was owned by that tribe, what is their sense of place to that university? It's gonna be fundamentally different than it would be for an African American in that same place. The Arapaho people were here before this university. It's their place. We're not bringing a student to a sense of place. We need to bring the university to that sense of place. So it's important just to think that way through. And what does it mean for people to connect to place? But sometimes that sense of place can simply be that connection and celebrating that connection. This is Grand Teton National Park. It's one of my first national parks. It was also the park that had that first African-American ranger. Um, Dr. Robert Stanton, who went on to be the first director, African-American director of the Park Service, and I worked for him for two years. And it was so important to me that that park celebrated that little moment of time where this young man came up from Houston, Texas, to be a gate ranger. And this is actually his, they actually saved his little kiosk. This is his original kiosk and restored it. And it's now at the Jenny Lake Visitors Center. But it tells such a powerful story of the park trying to be welcoming to all people who pass through it and that there's a connection. Black people were here. And it's really funny on how many black people you see taking a picture by this sign. 
because it tells them, yeah, we're in Wyoming, but there were a lot of black folk out here. And then I want to spend the most of the remainder of my talk about is, is this issue of security. And we've all spent a year in the pandemic. And so I think when we talk about security, we have a lot of images that come in mind. And I think this is the pivotal point for us to discuss why security is so important when we think about science and we think about how we do field science in our different settings. And security can be simply that sense of being okay wherever you are. <clears throat> Excuse me, and think about Christian Cooper in Central Park, New York City, and having the police called on. And my colleague at Clemson University, who actually just wrote a second book on this, you know, sort of talk about the nine rules for black birders. And one of his rules, and this is, it dates him a little bit, talks about don't bird in a hoodie ever. And many people may have forgotten about Trevor Martin, who was shot while wearing a hoodie or while walking in a white neighborhood. And his point is that, you know, he says, as a birder, I can choose to do my science as a leading ornithologist. I do not study owls. Why don't you study owls? Because I'm not safe at night. For me to go out into an area at night as a black man, as he says in the bottom, you're going to have a lot of conversations with authorities, especially if you look like Forrest Whitaker. So his point is that now his whole science has been defined by this issue of identity because he can't study birds at night. He doesn't feel safe in studying birds at night. So let's think about some definitions about safety and security and then bring us back to our diversity, equity, inclusion thoughts. And again, if, if you have questions, please shoot them in the chat. I can't see the chat, but uh, Eric is keeping track. So do shoot some questions in there. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a hint, especially if you're involved at all with uh, academic administration. This is actually pieces that comes from something that impacts every campus on the United States. So these are some definitions. Security and safety are considered things that may impact your ability if you're a, if you're a culturally relevant or inclusive community you know, how are you are informed by that research? So what does that research mean and who performs the research makes a difference? And then thinking about the risk, and this is looking at the issues of environmental justice, how does they occur on those acts? And then what happens if an individual is either threatened, intimidated, or feels otherwise in comp um, compromised? in a particular setting. So just think about that for a second. The technical terminology is called hate crimes. And hate crimes and bias can be anything from race, gender, gender identity, religion, orientation, et cetera, are all nationally recognized as potential hate crimes. But what we don't remember is that the institution can help identify that category of bias. And why that's important to think about is because what happens on your campus's lands or where they own is part of the institution's responsibility to figure out what bias might be. And so how does that relate to what we're talking about in terms of diversity and inclusion. It's like, is this a separate issue or is this the same? There are two things that work here. One is simple assault, and the second is intimidation. And if you're looking at diverse people, and you can look no lot further than George Floyd or Christian Cooper, that safety may occur in the field setting or in your ability to be a scientist in the field. And then what happens when that occurs on campus? So this is an act that traces actually its origins back to the year 1990. And some faculty, if they're faculty on this call, may be familiar with this act. But this is your direct quotes from the Clary Act. And the Clary Act has to do with campus safety and security and the right for every student to know what goes on on your campus. And most people, if you ask them about the Clary Act, they said it has to do with sexual assault or sexual harassment, um, such as the Me Too movement. But if you look at the Clary Act, it actually has to do with hate crimes as well. 
and that's where Black Lives Matter is coming in. So every campus in this, on this, in this country has a Clery Act representative. Your campus has several. And anytime you're working under the auspices of the university, the Clery Act is in effect. So who's responsible for this? So I wanna think about that and we'll go through our closure and have some time for questions. So identity, belonging, place, and security are four things that matter to diverse populations, probably more so than other populations. Do I identify as a scientist? Do I see myself as a scientist? And for the, all the women and others who saw the beautiful film, Picture of Scientists, that was such a, an amazing exploration of what did it mean to be able to identify as a scientist and be recognized as a scientist? And then what does it mean to belong as part of that team? How do we connect to place? And then are we safe? Are we secure? So this is part of a project that we just started with the University of, of uh, Minnesota um, at Duluth, uh, Berkeley University, and University of Cincinnati in Ohio um, called Voices. And we're all scientists, we're all geoscientists or ecologists trying to understand what are these barriers within our field, environmental sciences, and can we explore those barriers as scientists to look at identity, belonging, places, and security. And we do have two social scientists on this team as well. But our, because our sciences are so focused on the field, understanding these things and why of all the sciences, we persist in underrepresentation. So as I think as our Dean said, you know, the College of Natural Resource is the least diverse college on our campus. And I think our Dean's words were, we managed to beat out agricultural sciences and engineering for the bottom slot. So we are the least diverse on the entire college campus. And part of the question is asking what are the common values or common parameters that might cause that persistent least diverseness? And our argument is this issue of safety and how we feel like we belong, how do you identify, and what's your place? So I'd like to think about, we're all busy pushing diversity, equity, inclusion, that maybe now we think these three things might not be the same. But what does it mean from the perspective of the student? And what does it mean for a student coming to a non-diverse campus that simply fails under the Clary Act or others to report any hate or intimidation on campus? And then what is the Me Too movement versus Black Lives Matter done that changes things? I think, <clears throat> excuse me, for universities to think about. So I like to call this eyes wide shut. All the things that we fail to see, that we could see if we paid attention to, and then, and why that's so important. If I ask my white colleagues about driving students to Montana, that means we cross the state of Wyoming in the van that's marked with CSU and it's full of you know, black and brown students, what is your decision point? The decision point should be safety, but do they think about it? And have even thought of the term safety driving across country and what that means when you pull into a rest area. This was what I call Eyes Wide Shut. And this is a wonderful little book that was published recently um, by a, a, an economist from France called Unsustainable Inequalities. And his argument is that we can't understand the environmental processes because environment is actually, environmental conservation is actually a cultural construct. So we can't get to sustainability if we don't understand the social justice side, the equity side. And we can't get there by ignoring all the social inequities so you can't get to global sustainability so i like to call this like this, again this is eyes wide shut the blindness that we want to see environmental justice but we don't want to look at the social justice from the perspective of our own students or our own colleagues or our own departments or within our own science but that's that social justice piece that we're currently missing that's that environmental racism piece that's that environmental equity piece that we're currently missing so eyes wide shut is Jedi the right approach? I think I'm hoping that at least convince some of you that we may need to look a little bit beyond diversity, equity, inclusion, and ask ourselves, what do we really need to do in the environmental sciences? Maybe we need to spend a little bit more time thinking about the students' well-being, safety, and their security. So again, I said I would repeat this graphic. Now we can think about this graphic. What does diversity mean? Does it mean the same thing as equity? And does it mean the same thing as internal? And we can take ourselves out and ask, what happens if you just put the word safety on top of all this? And you'll see that the forces are very different. 
and they push in different directions and they push in different ways that are important just to understand as we look at diversity, equity, inclusion, that those forces are themselves different. So I want to sort of close in thinking about a little bit as I started, my sense of belonging is defined by who I am. I can't, I can't separate these pieces. So when I take my students out in the field, I have all this noise in the background, like these words in the background, civil rights, psychology, safety, aggressions, micro, all this stuff is something I bring to the table every day. And I need to take it to my students, so they take it to the table. Are they safe where I'm taking them? And are they aware, do they feel safe? Because if they don't, that impacts their idea of being, can I identify in this field? Do I wanna be a scientist? I don't wanna go back out in Wyoming. I don't want to be there. I don't want to be the only person. I don't want to be the imposter that everybody points to. Those are all expressions of feeling not safe, feeling like you're standing out. So identity matters so much that we pay attention when we look at diversity and inclusion. And the other sort of part of it to think about is the scientific enterprise as a whole. I mean, think about things like environmental justice. If your eyes are wide shut, can you ask of an environmental justice perspective about a community that is different than your own demographic. You may not see it. And if we're the ones defining the research around an environmental justice question, do we actually miss it? And this is an important thing when we think about the scientific enterprise in terms of what questions we ask, how we ask those questions, and then what is the outcome of those questions? How is the community impacted? So the National Science Foundation just very recently released a report and it was published in, in Til Tillman et al. in 2021 in Science Magazine. That's the issue of broadening impact. Can the science enterprise address the broader impacts for society if it does not represent society itself? And that's a really deep question that we should think about. Can we address the broader impacts of society if we do not represent the society itself? So I want to close on thinking about these unsustainable inequities, our blind spots, and maybe we're asking the wrong questions. Let's think about for a moment that the landscape, the language of the landscapes is a language of culture. And we shouldn't separate it. We just need to think about it, to acknowledge it, to incorporate it, to become an ally with all of these pieces that allow us to see why we're so undiverse. So I like to bring this into what I call wade into the river. And you think about a river, and I work in the Western US and you guys are even further West. You know, so rivers are an important part of our landscape, but what does that river represent? And what does that river do as it moves across the landscape? So, and I can't see the audience, if there are any African-Americans in the audience or maybe others, if I say, Wade into the water, wade into the water, my children, wade into the water. What does that river represent? The water. Oh, girl, thank you. I can't sing. <laughs> Dude. That's a passage on the Underground Railroad. That river is freedom. That river is moving towards freedom. But we take that same river and we stand at Standing Rock and that river now is life. Water is life for Standing Rock. Or that same river could be rafting and recreation. And I think it's so if we can just get to that point where that river defines itself three different ways in three different contexts that helps us define our science as being important to society as a whole, broadening that impact. To understand that river means life to the Standing Rock Reservation, it means freedom to the African Americans, and it may mean recreation to others, and pull all those together. So think about the science enterprise, why it matters, who asks the questions. Any barrier, any barrier to entry weakens the science, and it weakens its societal impacts. I think that's a really powerful statement. Any barrier to entry weakens science and weakens its societal impacts. So going back to my starting roots, being black from Brooklyn, the science of identity, 
is so fundamentally different for each people. And to understand that is how to be an ally, to understand these differences, celebrate these differences, that someone knows the, fall, the ending verse of my song is an important difference. And it's not bad. It's good that we celebrate our differences and where we all come from. And on that thought, think about if we want to define ourselves by a single metric, it creates stereotypes. And as a famous Nigerian storyteller said, stereotypes are not untrue, but they're incomplete. And they make one story become the only story. And I think our challenge here is let's not make DEI one story. It's not a single story. It's incomplete. We need to tell the whole story. And with that, I want to acknowledge my colleagues from the Voices Project that's working on trying to tell these different stories. And then also acknowledge my amazing students who I get to drag all over Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Park. This is actually in the Beartooth Wilderness um, and the support from the National Science Foundation. And with that, I hope we have some time for some questions. I'll stop share so you can see the chat. Yeah, and I think uh, Gillian, I'd just like to open it up. Uh, I'm not seeing questions in the chat. Um, so I guess if anybody has any questions, just feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask away. Hey, Gillian, this is Aaron Shanahan. Um, hey, Aaron. Hi. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm, I'm like your um, groupie with this presentation, <laughs> Kristen and I are. So um, I have a question. I was on, we were on a um, presentation, I think it was last Friday, and, and I had typed a question into the chat, but it ended and they nobody got to that question. But um, like you, and we've talked about this, um, I do take diverse students down to into Wyoming, and I'm always really um, pretty nervous about some of the small towns that we go into. And I think before I go, I'm, um, so I'm, a white woman, I'm in my early 50s and I'm a mother and I am a full on mother bear. So um, it doesn't matter who's working with me, I, that's just my personality. And I'm always like preparing myself for an encounter. And um, we have never had any issues um, that I have been aware of, but my, I know that my, what I'm preparing myself for is anybody even looks sideways at, one of the people I'm working with, I, I will just like jump in right away. But I wonder, does that take their power away by, you know, me, this white woman coming in trying to save the day, you know, or should you let, like, when do you intervene? Um, yeah. So Aaron, that's a great question. Um, and uh, the talk that Aaron's referring to for the rest of you is University of Montana. Um, held a um, session with four of their students who were diverse. And it was an incredibly powerful session. Um, those students had so much courage just to talk about their experience. There was two native students, one African-American student and one Asian student. Um, and yeah, I think it, it both took our breaths away for those of us listening to that presentation. The tricky part, and you know, I know also know Eric because we're both in national park service, um, is I always default to my national park service bringing. So my number one issue is safety. I've got to bring my crew home safely. I was on search and rescue crew for Yellowstone for many years. Our, our issue is to get everybody home safe. So I think we talked about this in another story um, last year when we took our students up to Yellowstone. We were stopped by the police. And we were driving in two big Colorado State University vans or with the Ford Expeditions, you know, big vehicles. Colorado State stamped all over the side. Come around the corner with three vehicles, come around the corner. Um, I pass the state trooper, keep on going. Second car passes and the state trooper stops the third car, the, the tail car. And I was fairly far ahead, so I was not that close to them. But, you know, we were waiting and the state trooper walks up to the second car, looks in at the blonde, blue-eyed driver, walks past her. She had set the pace and gives a ticket to the Hispanic woman in the second vehicle. And he asked her for her passport. He asked her for citizen papers. She's from Denver, Colorado. 
And, you know, during this whole episode, we're all watching him, not saying a word to the lead vehicle that set the pace. And he gave her the ticket. So after he left, we had to stop and have a, you know, this word belonging became so important to have this conversation of, and sit down side of the road with the whole team and talk our way through what had just happened. So she knew that we were there for her as a team member. It was not our place to correct this state trooper. It's not our place to say anything. I mean, that's dangerous. It's very dangerous. And it was important for us to make sure she was safe and that she felt safe in our company. Just two days ago, she reminded us of this story. And now she's angry. Then she was frightened. Now she's angry. And I think that's the reality that a lot of our students are going to face. And when we take students in the field, we need to be prepared for that. But it's not our place to jump in there and try and change that state trooper's point of view. Our number one priority is keep everybody safe. And that might be that I need to say nothing. You know, because I can't correct it. So I think very hard about where I stop. I think very hard what small town I drive through. I make everybody get out Little America, which is a horrible tourist spot, but everybody stops there because it's safe. And I've got to think about that every time I drive my students around and make sure they're thinking about it. So I think, oh, thank you for, Eric, for posting that seminar. It was a very powerful seminar. But thank you for that question, because I think that's one of the struggles for many allies is that if your eyes are wide shut, you don't see it. And then the incident happens or unfolds itself and you don't have the, the tools to think about what is, what is my outcome here? My outcome needs to be safety. I need to keep my students safe. You know, we have a place right outside of Rocky Mountain National Park that um, gives you a free pie samples. Huge Confederate flag in this parking lot. Do I stop there with a van full of students? No, I don't care how good their pie is. It's just, it's just not safe, like, you know, for me to pull into that parking lot. And I think sometimes just thinking through that, it's not the right or the wrong, it's what's my bottom line? Safety. Does that kind of answer your question, Erin? Yeah, that does help a lot because, um, yeah. So I think the danger is we get into wanting to say something and you're going to escalate. With the potential yeah. that, then you're no longer safe. Once you escalate, right. you're no longer safe. But also speaking for that student, does that student now feel safe? Probably not. Our goal was to make sure the student was safe. There's nothing we could say to the state trooper. We need to make sure she was whole. We also bought her a lot of fudge at the next stop, but that, <laughs> that helped out a little bit. But it was important that we thought our way through, is she safe? And can we get that through? Other questions? I have a question, and I don't know if you can answer this, but our university, Washington State University, is in a uh, relatively conservative area. And I'm wondering, as a graduate student uh, and future academic, how do I invite students or encourage students, graduate students particularly, or undergraduate students, to come to a school surrounded by uh, a conservative environment. Is there anything a university can do to promote a safe, equitable environment uh, when the surrounding community uh, is almost tangential to that? That's a great question. And I think that gets back to the sense of belonging and sense of place. You know, what the university does internally so, for example, you know, the Clary Act was really about a young woman who was um, raped and murdered inside a dormitory. And the fact that the university failed to report that. Um, and, and thank you for Annalise and um, thank you for coming. The issue is the same for Washington State. It's the same here for Colorado State University. We should be reporting so students can come with eyes wide open as to what is the boundary here because we need to make sure that they can then navigate that spaces to what makes them comfortable and what makes them feel safe. And so by hiding that information, we don't achieve that. And we open the door for us to make poor decisions, like where you do your field site. 
I mean, why do we have to be in a place that's not safe for that particular student? Can't we ask the same question about the fish someplace else? And often the case is yes, you can. You just have to think about it. You're not changing that student's science, or you're trying not to. Like my colleague at Clemson, I can't study owls at night. I'm not going to bring in a black student to study owls at night in Southern Colorado, in Southern in South Carolina. It's just not safe. I can bring him in to study, you know, also to other birds, but in this community, I can't do it. And I think that's the important is just a, that's that allyship, being able to recognize that those boundaries and prevent that boundary from impacting that person's ability to identify as a scientist. And, you know, and th all those things come together. I work on insects and insects are great because you can, they're everywhere. Um, so you can invite like a disabled student to, to, to learn how to study bees. I don't need to be in a remote site to study bees. I can do it on my own backyard. But I can still learn a lot of questions about climate change and bees and this, that, and the other thing, and encourage that student to be part of that identity as a scientist, even though the ability to go to a remote site. But we're all field scientists. We love our remote sites. We want to go to the craziest place and the tallest peak and the this, that, and the other thing without thinking about, does it impact people in different ways? And I think if we keep our eyes wide open, and let those students have that skill set so that it's not them personally, they can still identify as a scientist. It's our field and we need to adjust our field internally. Does that kind of answer that question? It does. Thank you very much. And, and sometimes I think we miss those low lying flutes of just, just thinking about it. You know, I'm from New York City and we still sort of, I went to school in Harlem and because at that time, the LaGuardia High School of Music and Art was up in Harlem. And the, the thing was thinking about, okay, who's going home at night? How late is that field season going on? It was not safe for white students. So it was the actual opposite there. And how the track team would deal with it is we would all take the same train. And it's important just to think about, you know, those survival skills in different places, but we don't bring them into our science. And therefore, we then allow that to restrict uh, perfectly bright student, a perfectly excited student from thinking about themselves as science, because we've put those barriers. Remember that barrier to entry impacts a scientific enterprise. They can enter anywhere. And how do we help them enter anywhere? So I hope that helps a little bit. Other questions? Thanks for coming, Dr. Bowser. I, um... You know, I think our university and does not have a very diverse faculty or graduate student body. And it sounds like I think our undergrad student body is a little bit more diverse. And I know that like representation is really important. I guess, do you have any just recommendations or anything that, you know, you think our faculty or administration can do to, you know, help kind of boost those undergraduates? It's, yeah, you're fading in and out a little bit. Um, I think the hardest thing for you, and, and our university is not very diverse either. I mean, I think in the entire natural sciences, and that's including biology, everybody else, and natural resources, we have two African-American females. You know, I'm, I'm in natural resources, and there's one gal over in, in biology, so we're not doing much better. But I think it's this issue, and I think the struggle is hard, is on allyship, how to be an ally, and what does it mean to be an ally? And I think... The graphic I showed at the beginning, I think we, we, you know, it's one of those things like, wow, we should pay more attention to that. The change is so fast in the representation of women. I think we haven't really processed what that means. So how do we take those tools to reach back and pull another group forward? And I think that's where the Me Too movement has powered itself forward and celebrate that movement. But maybe we need to reach back and help the Black Lives Matter move to the same place in the sciences because those two movements pull people to a different place where we were. So I think one of the challenges is that the, the number of women has changed so fast that women will still, in my own faculty department, they'll still say, well, we're gonna reach for the unrepresented minorities. We're gonna get some African-Americans and we're gonna get some women. And you're like, whoa, 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 <laughs> slow down. Women are not underrepresented, but that's in the last 10 years, under 10 years, about the last five years that that change has occurred. Our vet school is 72% female. It's a dramatic difference. 
So I think part of the question is how do we process that? How do you get faculty to process that? And how do we then use that to embed her? So going back to the Clery Act, it's really interesting. If you ask faculty, and it's really challenging to ask any of the faculty on the phone, what was the Clery Act set up for? They almost all will say sexual harassment. That's not what the act was set up for. It was set up for violent crime and safety. So it's interesting that the Me Too movement has pushed it such that sexual harassment and other things now are part of the discourse of what the university functions for its policies and acts. We need to push it so it thinks about diversity the same way as something that it needs to address systematically with policies and actions. And some of those are very low hanging fruit. You need to report your Clary Act. Hate crime should be reported so students can navigate that space safely. Colorado State reported one hate crime in the year that our mosque on campus was burned down. You can't tell me that was the only crime that happened on, on this campus of 60,000 students. Probably because I have a Muslim student who got yelled at and chased by vehicles and you know Trump supporters, et cetera. So all of these things are moving in space, but if we allow this university to accept, embrace, and then try and change. So I see Jesse has a question how do people can people like me get a better sense of what makes people not like me feel unsafe or unwelcome without making the finger out? Well, I, I, that's a great question. I would not ask them. I would just think, you know, eyes wide open. There's so much in our environment that we just don't pay attention to. And I love my yoga teacher. There's always about you got to pay attention to your inner workings and your inner, you know, all these little pieces of yoga. And we have to do the same thing about our environment. Um, I also work in Yellowstone, which has got a lot of bears. So we spend a lot of time trying to teach students to pay attention to the environment, pay attention to signs of bears nearby um, and pay attention to that. But then we seem to forget that in our campus. So Colorado State will say, we're a really safe campus and we have no hate here. I don't have to go a block from my house to find a whole pile of Trump supporters and Trump vehicles and this, that, and the other thing. Um, less than a block from my house. So why does the university deny that there are people of different points of view in town such that students come in, can navigate that space, can understand what it means like to come here and let them then choose their feet. But we've got to give them the information so they can be safe. And yeah, you can miss things, but I think, you know, it's like within Me Too, and you should watch that film. God, everybody should watch that film, Picture of Scientists. It's a really powerful film. When the young man says, I can't believe I didn't see all this. I didn't process what was going on to his colleague during all these incidents of sexual harassment. He was there and he never reported it. She reported it 20 years later. So I think it's that eyes wide open. You know, look around. What do you see that may impact one student or another? What do you start to hear that may impact a student one way or another? And and it's sometimes scary how obvious it all is when we start to pay attention to it. Um, and it's not a good or a bad, it's just eyes wide open. I am not gonna stop at that town. It's a beautiful little town. I'm not gonna stop there. And I don't need to give the students a whole explanation. Um, it's like we're stopping at Little America and the next stop is here and off we go. And then, then we can talk through because they still feel safe. That's back to my safety, they still feel safe. I don't wanna compromise like a year later, my student is still mad about this incident with the state trooper. She does not want to go back to Wyoming. I may have lost her as a student to take to Yellowstone National Park. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be in that position. So I want to manage so my students never impact that way. So I have to be thinking ahead, thinking two steps ahead. I don't drive at night across Wyoming. I don't care that we're a day late coming back. We're going to wait and then drive during the day. I, I just can't risk it for my students to go in some places in the state that's very conservative. And I think about that. So thank you for that question. It's not an easy answer. And I think for allies, that rapid change makes it harder to see what some of the trends are. So thank you. I see someone has a hand up. Yeah. I have another question. Uh, I also belong to a, another minority and also I'm a woman. And definitely I can see that I have seen like sexism and those things that 
or microaggressions or small things. And I'm the kind of person that does pay attention, but sometimes I feel overwhelmed by that. And definitely I cannot imagine how it would be if I would be like, even from uh, an African-American or another minorities that may be even more impacted by all these um, things in the environment and that affect our safety. So my question is like, how do you, I mean, how do you avoid to be overwhelmed? How do you avoid to feel like, oh no, there is nothing that I can do. I mean, like I have to work three times as hard as any like white person. I have to worry about my safety like three times more. Like how do you, what do you tell yourself? Just just to, to, to be able to say like, no, this is science. This is what I want to do. It doesn't matter that it's more difficult. Like what do you tell yourself? That's a beautiful question. Thank you so much for asking that. Um, first thing I would say is that I don't believe there's anything as, as such as a microaggression. Every aggression is macro. You know, and I think that's one of the problems that we want to say it's a little tiny aggression. I don't see it as tiny. It's a big aggression. It's always a big aggression. But I think, you know, to be honest, for, for me, some things are family. I have a very strong family. Um, they still never figured out what I did after working 20 years in the National Park Service. They're all from Brooklyn, and they, and they believe that concrete is a pretty good thing, and there's not a whole lot of reasons to step off of concrete. <laughs> um, so they're always curious as to what I do. I do love nature. I love being outside, and nature is very restorative, and thinking about, you know, we're going to Yellowstone in a couple of weeks, and it's a gorgeous park, and so forth. So allowing the positive and not shooting on the negative is so important. But I also think for me, what I like, the, and I probably said it way too many times in this presentation, why I like the word safety is it's neutral. It's positive in its intent. You want everybody to come home. And so it doesn't bring that negative, I don't want to say something bad, I just want to be safe. And so I can juggle that negative energy into my job is to be safe. I want my students to be safe. I want them to have a great time. So we're just not going to go there. We're going to go over here because it's not my job to fix this guy. I, I can't, but we can have a great time at the, at the fudge shop. We actually do stop at one fudge shop every year and we clean them out of fudge because a woman in charge of the fudge shop is a beautiful individual. She's very friendly. Um, I show up with some years, it's 20 black and brown students that we dive into the shop in Du Bois, Wyoming and eat every piece of fudge. And she welcomes us every year and becomes a really highlight. That's my safety highlight. So I think it's important to think about what, two things. One is, you know, that nature is a beautiful thing. That's why we're all in this field and we should celebrate that. You know, the bees and the bumblebees don't care what you look like. Uh, well, maybe they do. If you're wearing bright colors, they're pretty happy. <laughs> but, but I also think it's that celebration of that moment of wonder when my students see Old Faithful go off for the first time. It makes it all worthwhile. Oh, we see the first bear. Last year, we saw nine bears, grizzly bears. I mean, so my students were over the moon um, and we were safe each time. So each one of those little rewards helps me say, okay, it's worth me navigating across this landscape each time so they can take that student and they see Old Faithful go off for the first time. They see their first grizzly bear or see some cubs playing in the road. All these little things that make it magic. So I think that's my strategy is to focus on the beauty of life, the beauty of nature, the love of parks. Um, I'm very passionate about our parks. I think we all need parks and we should all be able to get to those parks safely. And we should all enjoy every park that's out there. And we all need to protect them because the parks are public spaces. Congress can deauthorize a park as quickly as it can authorize one. So we all need to protect them. So that's what keeps me going. That's what keeps me going. In the park service, you used to say you get paid in sunrise and sunsets. And it's so true that when you get to see that student take a picture of a sunrise, the first one they've ever seen, probably because we dragged them out of their tent early in the morning, <laughs> but you know, and, and to see them grow, to see them grow, to be able to, to appreciate little things like bumblebees, is just magic and allow that magic to rule my decisions rather than the negative. So I hope that helps. I don't like using negative language. I like to be positive and think there's so many ways we can be positive about this. Does that, does that answer your question a little bit? Yes, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much for asking that question. So Eric, how are we doing on time?
Yeah, I was just going to say, Gillian, it's a few minutes after five. So I was, I was going to offer, we should probably wrap it up. Um, but I was going to say, if anybody has any questions, um, everyone that's in this meeting should have my email since I sent out kind of the, the outreach for it. But if you wanted to ask Gillian a question, you could shoot me an email and I could try to um, uh, put that your way. Um, I know some people just prefer to ask questions that way, but I think we could potentially continue the conversation that way for those that still have questions. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, but um, so I guess with that, maybe we should just wrap up and uh, I guess I'd like to say thanks to everybody for um, spending, spending your hour with us and uh, hopefully uh, everyone benefited in some way from, from listening to Gillian. Yeah, and I guess for just a final word, I, I start, realized I forgot to turn my video back on, so I apologize. Um, thank you all for, for listening, and thank you all for you know, thinking about diversity and inclusion, and I hope we also think about protecting our parks and keeping our parks for the next generation is just so important for all of us. So really appreciate you guys' time, and thank you for the graduate students for the invitation. You guys are next generation of leaders. So we need to make sure you protect Yellowstone for the next hundred years <laughs> and everything else. So thanks so much for the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.